Hi, my name is Joseph Anoy Squires from Well Prepared. We're disaster preparedness experts. We'd like to ask the question, do you have what it takes to survive? Today we're going to talk about some of the worst case scenarios, why you need to be pre well prepared to survive for up to three years. Like I said, these are some of the worst case scenarios, things that most people don't like to think about. When we think about disasters and preparedness and emergencies, most people are comfortable thinking that if they prepare for three days or maybe three weeks, that um, everything will be better and help will arrive and someone will come and, and restore things to normal and life will go back to the way that it used to be. That's not always the case. And in some cases, life will never go back to how, to how it used to be. So you might want to stop and think about some of those circumstances and what you could do or should do or would do in uh, those cases and what you would need to do in order to survive. Um, basically, uh, most of these emergencies and disasters are depicting a total collapse, a collapse of the economy, a collapse of society, social order, justice, law, um, a collapse of our agriculture, um, the means by which we survive and get food and medicine and water. And you'd have to kind of think outside the box or go back to some of the self-sustaining and self-reliant means of surviving that most people have inherited from their parents and their grandparents and their ancestors that we've developed for thousands of years. A lot of these things are, are the lost tools and the lost knowledge of how to forage for food, how to, how to plant and grow food, um, how to preserve, how to cook, how to hunt, how to clean, how to create and build your own home, how to start a fire even. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people go out in the woods and cannot start a fire without a gallon of gasoline. Um, it's almost impossible for them to actually provide for themselves and take care of themselves. Well, some of these worst case scenarios would be world wars, uh, an economic collapse, asteroid impacts, volcanic eruptions, and maybe even EMPs and solar flares. Um, we'll go over most of these topics right now and later we'll talk about EMPs and solar flares on another video. As far as World War III or World Wars, a lot of people believe that the next World War will be the last World War. Um, some of the creators of the nuclear bomb and the atomic bombs said that the next world war would be the last world war because after the next world war in which nuclear weapons are used will be sent back to the stone age where if there is another war we'd be fighting with sticks and stones and arrows and knives. Um, it's, a, it's a major threat that we faced since the 50s. It was a good 30 years where we were in a cold war and people were very uncertain. They were worried and scared that we would have nuclear annihilation that Russia or China or another nuclear nation would launch nukes against us or we would launch nukes against them. Um, we had bomb shelters being built in the U.S. School kids were taught how to duck and hide underneath their desks to try to avoid the calamity that would come in a nuclear explosion. So it's really important to realize that it's a real threat that we've considered a lot about and then that threat was somehow alleviated and went away. So the treaty that actually ended the Cold War and prevented nuclear annihilation worldwide was called the ICBM Treaty, which is the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Treaty. It was based on the concept of MAD, which means Mutually Assured Destruction. Basically, if we push the button and launch our nukes, then they'll push the button and launch their nukes and everybody dies. So nobody wants to push a button, that way everybody has peace and security. The MAD concept, was adopted by a variety of different nuclear nations and it was made to assure that no nation could um, develop weapons or achieve a, a status that left another nation vulnerable to nuclear attack. That way if you push a button, I push a button, everybody dies so nobody's going to do it. That treaty basically prohibited nations from creating missile defense systems. A good example would be the Patriot missile defense system that was created in 2004 by President George Bush. That Patriot missile defense system actually broke the ICBM treaty and put us back into a state of Cold War. A lot of people say that we're in the middle of the World War III right now. By breaking that treaty, that basically gives the US or any other nation that breaks the treaty and creates some kind of missile defense the ability to stop another nation's nukes from hitting our continent. What that gives us is the upper hand. If we can stop another nation's nukes from hitting us, but they can't stop our nukes from hitting them, then there is no threat of mutually assured destruction. We have the upper hand, and we're th the ones that can actually push threats and, and move nations according to our will. At the same time that we broke that treaty, Russia, China, both publicly spoke out and said that it was a big mistake. They started to develop weapons of their own. So in essence, we've passed the state of 
the Cold War into a new active war, and we're fighting proxies, um, us against different countries and different interests around the world. Over 19 nations in the Middle East experienced tumult in the Arab Spring uprisings and revolutions. We've seen dynasties, um, countries that have leaders and kings and princes that have gone back thousands of years being uprooted by the influence, a lot of time economic influence, of the United States inside of the Arab nations. So this destabilizes the entire area and, and creates a, a, an attitude and a environment for things to breed such as terrorism like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other like-minded forces. So now Russia, of course, is actively fighting some of these forces or fighting different forces that we are allied with. Unfortunately, some of the Russian forces are striking U.S. allied or U.S. trained, CIA trained forces um, that are fighting against people like Bashar al-Assad or other people that we label as dictators and try to overthrow. So through our economic might, we go in and we support one side and Russia or other communist nations or other nations that are allied in, in, in whatever sense fight a proxy war against the people that we're fighting against. It's like pushing pawns on a table. What it does, it destabilizes the nation, creates whole societies and populations that grow up um, with animosity and with hate towards one or both sides that we're fighting inside of their nation. Um, you know, we're, we're killing people's families and, and raising children that are fatherless and that have experienced war firsthand. And then no wonder we have things like ISIS that come to be. Even China right now is mobilizing and expanding in the light of some detrimental U.S. trade agreements um, in the Asia Pacific. So we recently came out with the TPP, which is a Trans-Pacific Partnership that basically is an inclusionary deal um, economically that allies different nations with the U.S. for trade to support the U.S. dollar and actually devalues the yuan. So we've kind of excluded China from trade and from the, the lessened tariffs and different uh, prices and charges that we associate with trade inside of these nations. And a lot of these nations border China exclusively, and we've kind of left them out of that deal. It's a sort of an act of economic war. Um, a lot of people are afraid of the idea of World War III. They insist that nobody would want to do something like that. No one wants to launch nuclear weapons that are going to destroy the world. It really wouldn't take much. We talk about EMP later, where we show you that a single nuclear weapon detonated in the atmosphere can actually take out electricity and electronics for an entire nation such as ours or another nation that could be one of our allies or our enemies. So it doesn't necessarily take um, a mass amount of resources, money, troops, people with boots on the ground, tanks and airplanes to, to cause World War III. All it takes is some disenfranchised, disgruntled person that joins a, a terrorist organization with the means and the ability to pull off a terrorist act, and, and of course the reason, uh, there's a lot of people that, that have plenty of reason to hate our country or to falsely blame our country for some of their ills and their sufferings, to come to America and to kick off or start, spark whatever fire that they can, that can lead to things like World War III. We saw recently a uh, aircraft, passenger aircraft that was shot down outside of Ukraine. Those types of, of events can actually enrage one nation against another, especially when it's full of one nation's citizens and peoples. So that can lead to further conflict, especially with organizations like the UN, where someone can demand that action be taken against another country. And all it takes is the misguided actions of one person or one group, such as ISIS, Al-Qaeda, um, rebels inside of Ukraine or Syria, to start off a world conflict that can tumble and rapidly fall out of control. World War Facts, <clears throat> nine nations have nuclear weapons, totaling over 20,000 nuclear warheads worldwide. 20,000 nuclear warheads is enough to destroy the world dozens of times over. It doesn't take very many. In fact, the detonation of just a dozen nuclear warheads could cause after effects and nuclear winters inside of the world that would wipe out sunlight, that would pollute the world with all kind of radioactive isotopes, that would destroy the chain of life, and we would actually feel that for years, if not hundreds of years. So it doesn't take an all-out war. All it takes is a few. If there's one nuclear weapon that's detonated anywhere by any nation, um, it could lead to retaliation from other nations. With a lot of treaties that we have nowadays, we have obligatory retaliation, where one of our allies is attacked. We are obligated by law and by the, the little letters that we've signed that says we have a mutual defense pact. So. With the volatile regions and all of our different uh, 
coalitions that we have in, in the Middle East and what's going on, it, it's very easy to speculate that something could tumble out of control and we could face a greater world war, a real threat that um, spirals into something that, that could involve the lives of tens and if not hundreds of thousands of people. So you definitely want to be prepared for something like this. The effects of a real world war, of a nuclear attack, of a biological attack, chemical attacks or an EMP could be far reaching and could be long lasting. So you want to be prepared to change your way of life completely or have the supplies necessary to survive a significant amount of time. This is beyond three days or three weeks. We're talking about three years. You're going to need things like seeds so that you can plant your food. Not just any seeds, non-GMO, non-hybrid. You want heirloom seeds, organic seeds, that can actually produce more seeds so that you can continue to harvest year after year. If you go to the store right now at Home Depot or Walmart and you buy seeds, they're genetically modified. They're, they're hybrid. They don't produce seeds. They're sterile in nature. So you're stuck having to buy more seeds. Now, if the whole idea is that the store is not there and you can't buy any more seeds, you're going to need some that can produce more food that you can, so that you can become self-reliant. A big thing that you'll lose is water. You need to have the ability to provide safe, clean, and healthy drinking water for yourself. So water filtration might be important. A lot of times there is water, but it's foul and it can't be used. And if you do, you'll get sick. You want a stockpile of medications as much as possible. If possible, you can get food. Years at a time, you can actually buy big bulk cases of food and keep them that last 25 years. They have a, an extended shelf life that only need water and maybe some boiling in order to produce a healthy meal that you can survive off of. Several enemies of the US have actually vowed themselves to our destruction and now have nuclear weapons. A good example would be Iran and North Korea. I don't need to tell you or remind you, but North Korea themselves have, have threatened several times to destroy America. They continue developing weapons of mass destruction. They've now made rockets that are ICBMs, that are intercontinental rockets, that have the ability to drop a payload of a nuclear weapon, a biological weapon, or a chemical weapon on the continental US. Iran themselves have vowed themselves to the destruction of Israel, which is one of our main allies. At the same time that Israel is our ally, they have a lot of enemies in the area. The reason why a lot of those enemies dislike America is because we go in and we have our own economic and military policies that says who can have what kind of weapons and who cannot have what kind of weapons. In the meantime, we give weapons and money to their vowed enemy, Israel. So we give Israel nukes and we give Israel F-16s and we give them billions of dollars, but we starve these other countries and tell them that they can't have any weapons. What happens? They become infuriated with us. They hate us for arming their enemies and starving them out. It's an old tactic like sieging a castle. So a lot of these countries through our economic ties have come to hate us and they are in possession or can easily become in possession of weapons of mass destruction. I know we've heard it before that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Did he or didn't he? Did, does Bin Laden have access to it? We do know that there are certain nations that are nuclear nations. One of the major ones that we have to worry about is Pakistan. 16 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 came from Pakistan. Where did they find bin Laden eventually? In Pakistan. Pakistan is an extremely volatile country that does have nuclear weapons. So if anything were to happen in Pakistan, any kind of government uprest or upheaval or civil disobedience, there's a good chance that those could become unstable. Unstable in a sense that they're not secured. Somebody could get those. We've recently heard that there was a threat in Moldova Moldova is an old Soviet bloc nation that was previously communist. They recently, uh, a few years ago, the FBI foiled a plot to sell nuclear materials to ISIS in Moldova. So this is old Russian weapons that they lost control of, they no longer secured, or when, when the Soviet bloc fell, they no longer accounted for them. Somebody got the wise idea, hey, we can make millions of dollars and sell these things to ISIS and take out our enemy at the same time. They foiled that plot, thankfully, but how do we know that there wasn't another plot before then or there isn't another plot after then? Something that you have to consider. If one of these nuclear weapons or biological weapons are detonated in America, there is going to be a retaliation. Who knows who would do such a thing or why they would do it, but if we look at retaliation for a nuclear attack, is most likely going to be in kind, nuclear itself. And that could spiral out of control and create a whole nuclear war. The U.S. has bases on at least 74 countries and troops practically all over the world. The problem with that is that not only are we agitators and agitating and, and, and basically imperializing all these different countries, but our resources are spread pretty thin. 
we don't have the resources, we don't have the manpower to technically defend the homeland here. A lot of people would root for the idea of bringing the soldiers back and securing our homeland, but we have borders that are just leaking like a save. There, there's people coming in by the thousands that we don't know who they are, where they come from, where their allegiances lie, what kind of illnesses, mental or physical, they might have, and they just bring in anything and everything that's completely out of our control, including the possibility of terrorists coming in across our unsecured borders. So with our troops spread so thin, and in some cases in, in mass amounts in small areas, we've got you know, 200,000 troops here in the Middle East, sometimes that makes them more susceptible and more vulnerable to a weapon in that region. You know, they can't necessarily reach our troops here in America, but if we got all of our troops over there in the Middle East, they're an easy target. They can easily deploy a small rocket to get towards them. It doesn't have to be an inter intercontinental ballistic missile. Here's a map of our US presence around the world. It shows all of the countries. Of course, our country is not grayed out because it's right here. But these are all the countries abroad that we have troops in, how, how thin our nation is spread and our armed forces are. And also, you look at the influence that we have over all these countries. Usually this is a good representation of our trade agreements because we enter military agreements with the countries that we do trade with. So you can see that not only do we have military troops in these areas, but more than likely we also are dependent upon these nations for the distribution of our goods, whether it be food, electronics, different appliances and resources. This, this map shows total nuclear warheads. I talked about all the nations that have nuclear warheads. This is after a, uh, nuclear deproliferation de treaty that, of course, allegedly reduced nuclear missile rates around the world. But this still shows the countries that have nukes. There are other countries that have nuclear weapons, uh, mainly in Europe, the EU nations, that actually house American weapons. It's, it's like a mutual defense treaty in which we allow their, our nuclear weapons to be deployed on their airplanes or their ships or their submarines or their tanks in the case that we would need to use them. These are the actual nations that have nuclear technology and own nukes themselves. And um, it's actually scaled by who has the most. Russia, of course, having nearly 8,500. United States having 7,700. And it goes down pretty steeply from there. Keep in mind that all, not all these nukes are able to be launched across the world. An ICBM is a missile that goes into outer space. It attains really, really fast speeds, because in space you can fly 13, 20, 50,000 miles an hour. And then it drops down on its target with lightning speed and, and is otherwise unable to be stopped. And in many cases, it's even unable to be seen coming. It's like lightning striking your country. Economic collapse. Economic collapse is another uh, disaster that we definitely need to prepare for. It could be far reaching, but in the worst case scenario, it would last more than three years. An economic co collapse that lasts more than three years would be a complete collapse. It could lead to widespread chaos, it could lead to starvation, um, it could lead to war. A lot of times, if uh, another country that is hostile towards us or is also influenced or affected by our economy notices our economic collapse, that makes us vulnerable to attack. Some people presume that other nations that are hostile toward us right now that are affected by our economy and affected by our policies, they're just waiting for something to happen. If, if they see a natural disaster, if they see an earthquake, an asteroid strike, if they see economic collapse, if they see mass rioting in the streets, or if they see a disease outbreak, that is their go word. That's their opportunity to take us while we're down, to kick us while we're down, to get us while we're weak. So we definitely want to keep in mind that something like this that enrages and infects other countries as well, where they're susceptible to our, our economic policies, where they're susceptible to our stock market, where they're hurt when we're hurt, it also leads and opens the door for other things like war. Not only inside of our own societies and our neighborhoods, when the economy collapses, you'll see looting and rioting. We're talking about on a national level. The US is currently over $18 trillion in debt. That's what's announced. That's what's published. The reality is, if you compound interest and look at all of our other investments, or our bad investments in many cases, the total is realistically closer to $65 trillion. This is an amount that is mathematically impossible for us to repay. This is generations, hundreds and thousands of years of debt that we're looking at. China is even now selling off our debts. They're, they can see that we're insolvent. They can see that it's a bad investment. They can see that they need to value their own currency and devalue ours because ours otherwise is devaluing theirs. So we've seen in, the recent, in recent years and months that China and some of the, our bigger debtor nations are now selling off our debt to remove themselves from the risk that's involved from our economic collapse. So here's a good illustration of what $1 trillion looks like. Most people don't realize 
or even have a, a comprehend or grasp how big a trillion is. But a trillion is, is really large. If you look at uh, the illustration of the man standing next to the pallet, that's $100 million. Now all the way down at the bottom, next to the airplane with a huge field full of money, way off to the left of it, you can see a little tiny pallet with a man standing next to it. That is $100 million compared to a trillion. It's just an unfathomable amount. It's insane how long it would take to spend that much money or make that much money or print that much money. Of course, this money is not <laughs> actually printed. There's no physical money. There's no physical gold or oil or anything to back it up. This is just ones and zeros on a machine. This is promissory notes, debt. Here's some facts about our debt. The US government has to borrow 41 cents of every dollar that it currently spends. So imagine if you had to go out and get a credit card and your interest rate was automatically 41 cents, but all you could spend was a credit card. That's all the money that you have. That's where our US government stands right now. Every single dollar that they borrow, they have to repay 41 cents. And where does the 41 cents come from? If they're borrowing money from the, or the, the originator of money, where does the other 41 cents come from? It's interest, it's inflation, it's a bubble that is impossible to repay. That's why they burst. That's why they need to be bailed out. Yearly, the US government issued almost as much new debt as the rest of the governments of the world combined. We are spiraling out of control quickly where we've literally doubled our national debt during this administration. If you spend $1 every second, it would take more than 31,000 years to spend a trillion dollars. So that's a good example of if you sat here and just counted, how long would it take you to count to a trillion? It'd actually take you longer than 31,000 years because by the time you get down to you know, 100 and 299, it takes you more than one second to say each number. So, so it would take you tens of thousands of years to even count to that number. So asteroid impacts is another natural disaster that we want to be prepared for. This is a long-term calamity uh, that you'd need to be prepared for at least uh, three years, depending on the extent of, or the size of the asteroid. Um, it's a very rare occurrence. It, we do know that during the last 10,000 years, Earth was hit by about 350 asteroids as large as the rock that leveled 2,000 square kilometers of Siberian forest in 1908. That was one that was actually recorded that we were able to get the evidence of and, and do quite a bit of study on to see the effects of these types of asteroid impacts. Um, they're to blame to a, for at least one ELE, which is an extinction level event, wiping out all the dinosaurs and most of the mammal lives at, at the time. Uh, though no known asteroids are in the path of Earth, scientists only monitor about 2% of the sky. So considering that NASA and these different agencies, space agencies, do say that there are no known asteroids in the path of the Earth, being that they only monitor 2% of the sky, that leaves 98% of a lot of unknowns um, out that, that could leave us uh, vulnerable to uh, asteroids, meteors, meteorites, impacts that could come as small as uh, a piece of dirt, a rock, a baseball, or as big as a house. And in some cases, some of the asteroids that they monitor are as large as the size of the state of Texas. Um, we do know that these do occur very frequently. There's thousands of different meteors and meteorites that enter our atmosphere. Some of them do touch Earth. Uh, they're relatively small and don't do any damage. But as recent as 2013, a meteor exploded over Russia with the, with the power and the force of an atomic bomb. That was February 15th, 2013. That did shatter windows for hundreds of miles. It injured thousands of people, caused mass destruction and panic, and it was completely unknown. They didn't see it coming. They had no idea that it was even in our orbit. It was part of the 98% of the sky that, that they really don't monitor. So what we deal with is a lot of unknowns here, a lot of uh, definite risk that we can't see coming. Another good example is super volcanoes. Now, super volcanoes don't occur that often. There's a lot of volcanoes around the world. Um, thousands, in fact. Um, Yellowstone, unfortunately, is one of the largest and most volatile supervolcanoes in the world. Um, some recent studies have shown that there's a huge caldera of, volcano, uh, of, of volcanic lava underneath it that is highly pressurized and ready to erupt. Unfortunately, experts warn that the eruption of Yellowstone supervolcano could kill 90,000 people instantly. So we're not talking about the people that are affected by the ash cloud or affected by the sun being blotted out. 90,000 people could be killed instantly. This, that's how big this super volcano is. Two thirds of America would likely perish in the ensuing ash cloud in the aftermath of the ecological disaster. Worldwide damage would occur. When I say two thirds of people would probably perish in the ash cloud, we're talking about tens, if not dozens of feet of ash. Some places would be completely inundated with ash. 
where the ash is so heavy that it collapses buildings and people are hiding inside of them. In other cases, it would only be two or three feet or up to 12 inches. But even still, it's going to wipe out plant life. It's going to blot out the sun. It's going to kill animals. You can't breathe this stuff in. It's, made a, it's basically like little microscopic pieces of glass that would cut the inside of your lungs and you would choke and, and die, literally suffocate on your own fluids inside of your lungs. It's a very, very terrible death. Here's an example of a volcano. In fact, we've had a lot of volcanic activity in the recent years. It's increased exponentially, and we've seen some big volcanoes on the Ring of Fire that have become active. Um, in some cases, it just minor damage. Um, they, they reroute aircraft for a couple of days. But in other cases, whole cities and whole populations are evacuated from the area because they can't stay there anymore. Life is not sustainable. Here's a good map and an illustration. Uh, if you zoom in, we can see the Yellowstone eruption and what people predict would occur in the case of a Yellowstone, Yellowstone eruption. The very center circle shows 13 feet of magma coverage, and that actually encompasses several states. That's where they say up to 90,000 people would be killed instantly. No one there would be survived. It would be com completely covered with magma. That is the red hot rock, not just ash. Outside of that, covering almost 13 different states, is an evacuated zone where 10 feet of ash would pile. And this, this ash isn't going anywhere, so you can't stay there. You can't ride this storm out. You can't hide in your house and wait till it's over. You have to leave. You can't, nothing will survive there. Um, even outside of that, almost as far as New York, there would still be up to a foot of ash. The best thing you can do, officials say, is to wait for uh, official instructions on evacuations, which is what you want to do. You want to be able to get your, your, your bug out bag, your survival kit, and leave as, as quickly as possible. Remain calm, take your pets and livestock indoors. Don't drive anywhere and try to stay indoors. Most importantly is to stay indoors. Uh, keep in mind that if ash is falling and it, and it begins to get more than a foot or two on your roof, you don't want to stay indoors anymore. You want to find better shelter. Most structures are not built to sustain that kind of weight on top of your roof, and then you run the risk of, of collapse and being trapped or killed inside of your, your own home. So that was a good presentation on some of the worst case scenarios why you might need to survive for up to three years. There's a lot of other things that you might need to survive from. One of the, the worst that we, that we focus on would be an EMP or a solar flare, which could wipe out electronics. Make sure to check out our other videos to see how to survive an EMP and what you need to prepare for. Thank you.